Investors Chronicle. Thursday, the 18th of August. Welcome back to the Companies and Markets show. Uh, I'm John Rogers, joined over the line by Mark Robinson. Hi, Mark. Hello there, John. And Julian Hoffman. Hi, Julian. Hello there, John. Hi. Alex Newman joining a little later. And Dan Jones in the studio hosting as ever. Dan, what are we what are we talking about before that? Hi, John. Yeah, we have a few bits this week as usual. We are going to be talking about the gambling companies, uh, many of whom have reported in the past few days. Uh, We're going to be talking about uh, Balfour BT. had some pretty decent results out uh, this week as well. And then, yes, as you mentioned, we are talking to Alex Newman about his cover feature on equities, effectively, and why equities are still investors' best bet, even in, in dark times. Still the place to be. Well, before that, a little news roundup from the week that's been as usual. Uh, In inflation news, minutes from the Federal Reserve revealed they intend to keep interest rates at levels that will restrict the US economy for some time in their continued fight to rein in inflation. And in the UK, bonds sold off on the back of double-digit inflation data for July, 10.1% to be specific, with markets expecting the Bank of England to similarly lift borrowing costs sharply. German, Italian and US government debt also uh, has come under pressure. China's most valuable company has posted its first ever quarterly revenue fall. Tencent, the technology and entertainment conglomerate, saw revenue down 3% from Q1, though it's still reported $20 billion for the last three months, which, you know, I'd take. Elsewhere, the world's largest oil company, Saudi Aramco, has reported June quarter profit of $48 billion, almost double the level of a year ago. The company has reaped the rewards of massive production during this energy crisis. Do you remember when we all got really into building sheds and putting up shelves during the pandemic? Well, apparently not anymore. DIY interest appears to be waning, according to investment bank Jefferies, who said visits to websites such as Travis Perkins, Toolstation and Screwfix are down around 20% since the start of last year. And apparently we're not going to the cinema as much either, or at least not to Cineworld. Their shares fell 40% after a trading update said that admission levels have been hit by a lack of big name releases. Markets, UK and US markets, very flat this week. The DAX in Germany lost 2% on Wednesday, but it's also pretty steady over the last five days. And in Asia, the Hang Seng has lost a couple of percent since Monday. And finally, Japan has a problem with their drinking culture. The youth aren't drinking enough. The government has launched a campaign for young people to drink more alcohol uh, with the sliding consumption hitting state taxation. Rumour has it bosses at Nikkei are considering sending Mark Robinson to help make up the shortfall. Thank you very much. You'll be hearing from my, you'll be hearing from my lawyers shortly. <laughs> uh, and that just about does it uh, from me. Over to you, Dan. Thank you, John. Yeah. Uh, so let's get started. Not with uh, with booze, but with gambling. Uh, as I say, a few interim results this week. Uh, at a time when you know we're still waiting for this uh, long-awaited or long-feared in some quarters uh, UK gambling white paper and what it may hold. And we've had some regulatory action, uh, as it happens this week, too, in Entain's case. Mark, what was your take from the results this week? There were a mixed set of results for the the three companies themselves. But I did a little bit of research looking at actually what happens to the market when we go through economic downturns. And some of it is... uh, quite counterintuitive really uh, you don't you see a general fall away uh, in uh, gambling linked to uh, casino activities and uh, horse racing as well but you get a converse uh, increase uh, in uh, the purchase of lottery tickets which is uh, quite strange now whether this applies to online channels is, is not clear but I can say that uh, after the global financial crisis as well, the companies that were were quick to pick up and expand their uh, online channels did very well from about 2010 onwards. Now, that this was a point of uh, technological change as well. And uh, since then, you, you, it's certainly in the UK and, and in a broader sense, the, the regulatory framework has tightened. And in the case of the UK, tightened to a large degree, really. So especially with regards to like the the size of um, fees and uh, 
the length of time that gamblers can stay on some of these channels too. And it is an international industry, of course, now, and that's been facilitated by the the, the digital channels too. For instance, in the, the EU member states are still as, essentially autonomous and they can regulate on their gambling services on their own account. But as I say, in the UK, the gambling commission license there is it's a much tougher affair than you get in other parts of the world. The big opportunity, of course, in recent years has been the liberalization of the industry in the United States, the liberalization of the, the online channels. As I say, companies like um, Ladbrokes, William Hill and Paddy Power, as it was then, they did very well coming out from the, the global financial crisis. It's it's still far from clear. You know, you look at eight, 888's results there and revenue was down by a fair portion, about a quarter, I think. And the company is really banking on its um, recent acquisition of William Hill. I mean, that changes the sort of scope of the business itself. And it's probably a little bit too early to determine how the company will perform, even though uh, analysts have been slightly uh, bearish because of its um, lack of geographical diversification. Yeah, I, I was going to say on that point, um, the the geographic diversification, uh, you know, is interesting, as you say, Mark. You know, eight 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 is still, I think, you know, forty percent of revenue is still in the UK. Uh, it's a bit different for um, for Flutter and Entain. Entain actually is probably about the same. Flutter is a bit less, but. But, you know, we are seeing, Julian, in these results as well, we are seeing, you know, these companies getting ahead, continuing to try to get ahead of what might be coming down the line in terms of regulation by effectively, you know, putting a, a bit of a cap on their own revenue growth in an attempt to, you know, yeah, predict I think they what the regulator... Yeah, I see the writing on the wall. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I mean, there was that big fine this morning um, from the um, Gambling Commission that uh, put, slapped and uh, entang with a 17 million fine. Um I think the environment here is is not particularly is getting progressively less less say fair as it were um, mm. for the major gambling companies, particularly around things like um, uh, those casino games where you could just feed in money to um, uh, uh, kind of blackjack machines in betting shops. I mean that was all, that was a big scandal a few years ago. Uh, so they've had to cap the the amount that you can gamble on those. Uh, it, it, yes, it's 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 a very I mean, it's one of those industries that it's very cash generative. It's very dynamic, but whatever you you earn from that is always going to be the compensation for some sort of regulatory interference at some point. So, the, I mean, the yields aren't bad. Um, they've been trying to get to the states for years. I mean, I, I remember writing stories in 2011, 2012 about expansion in the U.S. and it, it never, you know, they always seem to it just seems to be slightly out of reach. Uh, it, it is on a state by state basis, of course, in the US yeah. too. So that, that that the sort of level of regulation does differ quite markedly. Uh, well, that, that's that's true. So it's not. I mean, the US is not one single gambling gambling market. It's basically Atlantic City and Nevada, yeah. <laughs> uh, where you, you where you know where you can make decent amounts of money. So yes, the the industry is a kind of crossroads. I imagine that they'll go more towards Asia because Asia is such a big gaming a gaming market as well I mean places like Macau and and that would that might fit their business model a bit better but yeah it's 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 there is there they do face multiple ongoing regulatory challenges and certainly the environment is far less tolerant than it was you know say 15 years ago here yeah uh, it seems to be you know quite similar in Europe as well continental Europe I think entertainers you know had some uh, or you know, uh, been exposed to these markets where there's a similar kind of you know pressure, you know, increased regulatory pressure there as well. Alex, you were about to say something. Oh, uh, I mean, I was just gonna just gonna add. I mean, just to jump on what um, Julian was saying about the the Entain fine there, <clears throat> and one of the comments from the, the gambling commission was that it was complete completely unacceptable anti money laundering and safer gambling failures. I just, I, just, I mean, specifically with Entain, I find it a very interesting company because they've they've tried since the end of 2020, um, which was a very interesting year for them, to kind of reform their image as, you know, an ESG play in very simple terms and that they, they just want to operate in regulated markets, you know, be proactive engagement, have proactive engagement with regulators. Um, so, I mean, g- given this, the fine related to the kind of the, 
the COVID year of, of December 2019 to October 2020, it's a little bit backward looking. But, you know, on, on other measures, I, I, I just, I can't help but feel, feel that it is window dressing, you know, this, this uh, you know, the sustainability charter that they, they launched at the end of that year. You know, just, just given the way the business operates, I mean, they finally repaid just under half of the furlough money they they claimed in 2020 and we wrote a fair bit about this because they were really one of the biggest recipients of it and yes their a lot of their retail stores closed in that year and you know the furlough money did enable them to support a lot of jobs but um they had a very sort of mealy mouth response to the, the whole thing given that their profitability absolutely soared in the pandemic as everyone you know was at home with little to do but to bet on you know, sporting fixtures in empty stadiums. So, um, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I just, uh, I, whenever you look at this 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 industry and and try and try and look at it on the sort of you know the leisure um, entertainment framework, you just keep coming back to the 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 way that they I don't know they 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 kind of can ride pretty roughly over over the sort of government, corporate governance standards you would want. Of a, of a of a company it doesn't help that they're all based in gibraltar as well that's the the other bone of contention isn't it so they're they're beyond the reach of quite a lot of gambling regulation from that point of view particularly the online operations but i mean it's an interesting one because you, you sense you have to look at the gambling industry now as something a bit like a retailer it's got a, <laughs> it's got a sort of profitable online market that's that they that has limitless potential in you know in certain areas um, and then it has this weird uh, retail estate of um, betting shops on high streets, which often are the only things left on high streets so apart from charity shops. Yeah, I mean, they they also, I think they like to be thought of as technology plays as well, because that, you know, particularly with the internationalisation, they have platforms, the gambling platforms, which they just replicate for, for new markets and tweak to, to match the regulation there. And, you know, for some investors, that's been, you know, that's been a very, very successful um play and it's an you know it's an interesting one because there's not many markets which haven't been fully internationalized by this point um but yeah i mean uh, on top of technology you've got this huge dollop as as both of both of you mentioned uh, of just regulatory pressure and you know it's it's you know the, the next calamities never seems too far away perhaps i'm being uncharitable on a uh, you know uh, not necessarily as a comeback to that but on a more positive note from the perspective of an investor in the sector, we, we touched on the US uh, just now. We, I did want to note that Flutter actually does seem to be making, uh, you know, notwithstanding the, the issues we've just discussed, but it does seem to be making um, good headway in the US. Uh, you know, revenues up quite strongly there. I think they're about a quarter of its overall revenue base now, which is quite a big transformation. So, I mean, maybe that is a sign that one company is finally breaking ground. But I think it's fair to say in the UK, you know, there's a reason everyone is diversifying away from their UK market where they can. That type of regulation is coming, uh, you know, not without reason, as we as we just outlined. So, uh, yeah. But I've, even in the US, then, I mean, I find that you're never very far away from there being some calamity. I remember, you know, in the early 2000s, it was all about online poker and, and 888, as it was in the time, was a big player in the US. And uh, they, they didn't get... They got um, hauled over by uh, a weird addition to some act on the regulation of ports. Mm. So you know, they added a, an anti-online poker thing to, to you know, a piece of legislation that you know said how many container ships you could bring into a port at any one time. And um, yeah, that that was the business gone. And I, my, my feeling is that even there, you, you know, you're you're betting, pardon the pun. Uh, that eventually there'll be something that that gets in the way of of there being astoundingly long term profitability, I would say. But uh, you know, you you have to look at the yields. I mean, if the yields are good, then that's the risk you take. Yeah. The fl- flutter as well has certainly cranked up the leverage to expand too. So I mean, that's obviously another issue. Uh, I think their um, uh, EV, uh, well, net debt to to uh, net assets is. A multiple of four, I think, which is uh, which is pre- pretty lofty by just about any other measure, I'd say. Yeah, certainly in the current environment. Well, let, let's move on from uh, uh, from the gamblers uh, and let's go to something a bit more, if not mundane, then then perhaps a bit more uh, straightforward. In some ways, Balfour BT, a company that did produce pretty good results this week after you know a pretty tough time. Um, 
Julian, I'll, I'll turn to you on this because you did write about uh, about them earlier this year, I believe, as a potential recovery play, and we're not quite there yet. I won't I won't fall into last week's trap of calling them a turnaround ahead of time, but uh, you know, some some promising signs there perhaps this week. Yeah, there was a very there was a very good set of results. So Emma uh, um, Gemma um, wrote these up very well. Um, the, the main thing about them is that they they're clearly getting over the various hangovers um, related to the core business. So they've settled this uh, US suit related to military housing. Uh, the, ba- the balance sheet is able to support uh, the, the, the buybacks that the shareholders are getting. Uh, it, it's a classic cor- corporate action story. Uh, and I mean, I'd like to attribute it to uh, obviously my unique, unique, innate foresight and genius, but um, it's clearly that down to the the CEO who's who's really turned you know is in the process of turning that company around. I mean, the, the, the question really though, from an investing point of view, is is the point is it at the point now where it has turned around, and is there any point in buying into the company based on what might be future performance? And, and there is a split opinion, I guess, on that. You you can say, well, actually, they've just back to average from being below average. And uh, you, you know that'll be reflected in the fact the shares won't go much further from where they are at the moment. But I mean, you know, fundamentally, it's uh, you know the, the company is back from from a very poor um, performance, and um, yeah, you can only be. It's sort of nice to be back at mediocre, really. I suppose is the, is the way mm. I would characterise it. Well, I think Gemma made the the point as well, which I think is uh, germane, is that um, throughout the lockdowns, it was uh, nourished to a large extent by its uh, ongoing maintenance work, where it that seems to be swinging in, in favour of infrastructure and utilities, which are um, which are sort of a more profitable part of, of the business as well. Um, you know, the, even su- support services have, have done very well, uh, and, it's, and it's helped them through some difficult times. But you would imagine greater profits lie in uh, uh, sort of utility work, and a lot of that is uh, funded or part funded through government channels as well. I mean, the only problem I would see, I would say, that with that approach is that you you don't know what the government ultimately is going to do. It was it was the same story with the outsourcers that, um, you know, they they crack down on the margins that the companies could make and that left people like capita high and dry. So, I mean, I, I'm not personally not convinced that, that focusing everything on that in the long term might be sustainable, but, you know, for, in terms of, you know, just rebuilding the company's profile and earnings, it's, it's not a bad media medium term strategy, but. Um, one, yeah. one thing I did notice as well, just on some other work I was looking at this week is, you know, these results do cap a pretty good, interim results period for construction materials companies, not just in terms of what's gone on, but another thing we touched on last week in terms of guidance, you know, there's quite a lot of construction materials companies upgrading full year expectations or, you know, saying we're at the top end, obviously about for BT, uh, Breeden, Ibstock, Volution, you know, the, considering what what's coming down the line, it, it's quite quite notable, really, that, that, you know, a lot of them sound sound pretty bullish still. Well, that might depend. I think you're right. Actually, it's it's it is an interesting feature of the season when you know there are a lot of ambiguity about other sectors. Um, that might be to do with contract timing, though. The, you know, that a lot of a lot of pipeline of workers come through in the first half that will you know earn and complete in the second. So mm. then, that you, you you have to be aware that the, the, the you know there are structural issues for how how cash flow comes through as well as. The, the fact that they might be doing inherently more business um yeah so i mean you'll only see that in the second half results when you know when the cash flow numbers come through and you can calculate the number of of paydays or whatever it is um you know debtor days yeah but yeah i mean i would expect that they'll you know from a share point from a shareholder point of view that they'll holding the shares at the moment isn't going to be a bad call as you go through the second half but um whether the first half of next year is going to be the same is um, is is an open question. I would say. Yeah, as you alluded to before, you know we have, you do hear a lot of talk about you know the U.S. infrastructure bill, the U.K. infrastructure plans, and and maybe some of that is starting to feed through. But there is there are inherent uncertainties there as to how and when, and of course you know competing with one another in a lot of cases doesn't mean everyone's going to get a, a decent share of the pie. Um, let's talk about our cover feature this week, though, which. Uh, Alex Newman has written. Uh, Alex, why don't you, you talk us through this of the concept to begin with? Because in some ways it, it's a, a straightforward idea, but equally it's one that can be hard to uh, 
to keep in mind or hard to keep believing in at times of difficulty, very much about, you know, equities as an asset class and their inherent strengths in good times and bad or yeah. things like that. Yeah, in good times, or I suppose strip out the good times and the bad times and it's over the long the long times and the long term. Really. Mm. Um, I suppose I, I kind of, I wrote the piece a little bit for, for someone like me who sort of worries a lot about I mean, it's probably a, it's probably an occupational hazard of, of being a journalist that you're always thinking about the near term things that are about to go wrong because we focus a lot of, on the negatives, and then the long term is very hard to see. So between that, uh, you know, the, those those two points, um, the future always seems. I mean, the future is always uncertain, but it's it's sometimes hard to feel positive about the long term. And you know, full disclosure, you know, when I say I'm right for someone like me, I do. Uh, you know, do invest in shares on, you know, behalf of, um, uh, you know, just both in a pension and, um, and for my daughter, it looks like long, long term, very, very vanilla, simple, um, uh, passive investing. But the, I mean, within, within that, you know, when, the, when there are periods of extreme volatility, and what looks like, you know, plenty of uncertainty coming down the line, you know, it's natural to question your your investment strategy and your your allocation, um, uh, and and you know, thirty year time horizons. Uh, we're often told, you know, things kind of, you know, they 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 sort of shake out in the end, and and the time in the market is better than trying to time the market. Um, but still, yeah, I mean, the the, the piece is basically, it, it's it's trying to look at, you know, even in a time like. Um, uh, 2022 when things seem very very difficult that there is there is a lot of value in in equities and everyone I spoke to um you know they still pretty much think that equities are the number one long-term game in town um for in terms of asset allocation yeah I think that makes sense I mean we we have had we have been for a period where you know the the Tina the phrase was there is no alternative was was helping you know or, or helping drive some investment theories and some investment narratives at least now as you say you know it's a very uncertain time people are sort of questioning whether the assumptions of the last few decades still hold firm but but the, the, you know and even if but i think the point is even if they don't the the fundamentals of you know equity strength are still still going to be there whatever almost yeah. environment we're in yeah no that's that's a very good point i, I mean it's um i, I don't want to paint the picture or give the impression that you know things are rosy or people think the returns the return profile of equities or any asset class is going to mirror the last 50 years um i mean there's some you know very very smart quant investors out there who who think that just just the uh, the nominal rate of return that, that we can expect of equities for any number of reasons just won't live up to um uh, you know, recent decades, regardless of you know central bank intervention or you know asset inflation, all the rest of it, it's just the rate at which economies are likely to um, likely to grow, and also the relative pricing that that equities have at the moment. So, um, uh, so you know, there's a team at a- AQR Capital, for example, who think that we should be getting used to you know something a lot lower than five percent average. Uh, annual total returns from equities probably closer to um three percent in in many geographies um but still you know when you compare that to other asset classes equities just have do have their advantages another point that, that you know i tried to make in the piece or that was made to me when i spoke to a lot of people is that in in many ways equities are one of the best ways to invest in human ingenuity given there is there mm. is this sort of limitless potential from the ownership of um, a company's profits relative to bonds or real estate, which in some ways boil down to claims on the cash flow rather than the, you know, potentially unlimited capacity to create, um, uh, to, to grow cash flows and then compound the, compound that growth over the years, which equities at their best, when they're doing their best work for portfolios can deliver. Yeah, I think it is a very interesting way to look at it philosophically isn't it you know that that you know you are effectively you're backing human uh uh invention really yeah. as you as you say in the piece you know which uh which we all you know need to do or all have a stake in uh um uh you know existentially as much as financially as well yeah. but but that's really what you're you're doing with equities and and what they can continue to deliver is that you know certainly that potential for significant upside which 
as you say, you know, the claims from other asset classes are somewhat different, but also, you know, even the, the short term outlooks there, I suppose, going back to a, uh, you know, straight down the line asset allocation point of view, you can see, you can see reasons to be cautious on a lot of assets right now as well, which, which, you know, perhaps once again, plays into equities hands. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a really interesting resource, which, um, you know, anyone listening to this can can find, um, which I, I was previously unaware of, which BlackRock puts out um, uh, and is continually updating. And it's their, their, um, it's their long term views on the returns of various asset classes. And we sort of break down some of those in the in the piece. Um, and it's obviously built on all these assumptions that, as we've said, can be questioned. Um, but it also plots plots those long term assumptions against volatility. Um, and, and, and what, you know, what we might be able to expect from UK equities, for example, um, compared to uh, global bonds. And I mean, just the, the nat- one of the one of the, one of the other points about equities is just the nature of the way they are they are priced. They are priced for risk, and that because that risk carries you know with one share potentially one hundred percent downside. So anyone uh, anyone who is planning to continually allocate money to equities over the coming years, um, I think even if even if we take you know these these long term projections with a a big pinch of salt because it's a very uncertain world. There are there are inherent elements to um, to the asset class which which mean that risk does become worth it um, over the over the long term. But you have to swallow extra volatility um, relative to cash, bonds, real estate, etc. If if you want to see those those um, returns realised in the end, yeah, it is about as you say, take trying to to take that long term view. Um, Although you know we, we've had a we've had a decent rally again the last few weeks, people might be feeling a bit a bit cheerier uh, than they were. But um, but yeah, behaviorally, the important thing is to to try and look past yeah. these things. It's a beha- it's can. a it's a behavioral piece, you know. Which you know, if you check your uh, uh, something else, I was I was um, unaware of is that if you you know the market something like fifty two percent of the time on a daily basis the market goes down. So if you check your portfolio every day, um, you're you know, you're, you're going to frame the, the narrative of how things are performing in very negative terms. If you check once a year, three times out of four, the market, you know, historically has gone up. I mean, that may not continue the, over the coming, coming years, but that's the historical record. So it's almost the less you, um, uh, the less you look at things, the, the rosier the picture can be. And Obviously, I'm not going to. I'm not going to sort of suggest people um, stop paying attention to their portfolios or don't think about things like fundamentals. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, the the point stands that you know you can frame things in 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 ways which um, make them seem a lot worse than they end up panning out to be. Um, I, I, I think Alex as well. It's interesting you, you mentioned before that um, total returns. Uh, globally are expected to pull back uh, in the coming years but in a sense this is this isn't uh, that surprising because a lot of emerging um, economies are now maturing and uh, the growth rates uh, will be relatively subdued compared to what they were 10 20 years ago I'm thinking here of China obviously but also countries like Brazil um, and the, the main point anyway e- even if you do get uh, reduced overall returns going forward part of the the job of this magazine as well is to appeal to stock pickers as well and if you if you're looking for alpha returns you know beyond beyond the general market increase it, it just shows there is still a place out there for uh, for stock picking even though as you say with in, in the case of your daughter you you're probably i don't know you're probably buying her a sort of global income fund and just just leaving it there and that's that's a good idea but we shouldn't. We shouldn't really. Uh, we we must remember that uh, you can actually achieve um, alpha returns uh, with with requisite knowledge and experience. I think. Yeah, de- definitely. I mean, my my point. That's my my saying that at the 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 top of the um, conversation wasn't to to imply that that's you know that's just what sort of works for me and also my kind of level of risk tolerance and also probably because editorially we we can't you know it makes it a bit hard for us to be stock pickers ourselves. But um. Uh, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the the point really is, it's not it's not um, about 
passive or or active really it's about the long term nature of of you know the, the the value of equities and yes if you can if you can find alpha then you know it makes the case for equities stand out um even more so it's it's kind of like two sides of the same coin really Mm. Yeah, we should. Yeah, there are uh, strict rules on what uh, you know we are allowed to hold for understandable reasons. But um, there are. But yeah, there should be. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mark. <laughs> there. Um, I suppose that's the ultimate behavioural test in some ways, isn't it? You know, whether you can be a, a stock picker and uh, you know it's, it's totally unachievable, I imagine. But you know, pay very close attention to the fundamentals of your companies and pay almost no attention at all to the, the short-term price yeah. performance. It's a, a difficult balancing act. But, uh, but yeah, some reasons to be optimistic, I think, which, uh, which are, you know, um, sought after, much sought after at the moment. <laughs> uh, that full piece is our cover story this week, and you can uh, find that uh, in the shops this week, as usual, and lots of interesting charts and data in there, as Alex has alluded to. That does, though, bring us to the end of our time this week. So thank you very much to Alex and to Mark and Julian, as ever, and to John. And thank you to you once again for listening. We'll be back next week with another Companies and Market Show. If you've enjoyed this podcast and you want to hear more from the IC, don't forget to check out our separate interviews podcast. This week, we speak to day trader and IC columnist Michael Taylor. Uh, On that podcast, you can hear all about his investment process, how he manages risk, where to locate top stocks, uh, much more. That is available right now on this podcast feed, or you can find it on our website.